Hey, folks. So the web benefits from a healthy relationship between browser vendors and web developers. And framework authors and their users are often at the forefront of trying to find a healthy balance between DX and UX. So today we thought we'd bring along a few folks from frameworks, libraries, and their users to have a chat about what a better future could look like. So joining us on the stage, we first of all have Andrew Clark from React. Andrew? <laughs> Next up, we've got Jason Miller from Preact. <laughs> we have Steve Orbell from the Polymer team. <laughs> Rob Wormald from Angular. Tracy Lee from this.javascript and rxjs. <laughs> Chad Itala from Glimmer and Ember. Woo. Sean Larkin representing Vue.js and Webpack. <laughs> Malta Ubel, the tech lead of AMP. <laughs> and finally, Alex Russell from the Chrome team, lover of frameworks. <laughs> All right, let's sit down. So thank you to everyone that managed to get their questions in today. We have a very special prize for the best question, courtesy of Alex. Uh, the very best question today gets a very average Moto G4 phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to stay over oh, here for yeah. now. Awesome. So let's, let's get into it. Um, very first question that came in was, which features, if any, would make your life as a framework author or user easier if they were added to the JavaScript language or web platform more broadly? Uh, Jason, do you want to start us off? Sure. So there's been stuff, some stuff going around recently about a proposal called DOM change list. Um, and I think one of the end games of this spec is basically a way to serialize a set of mutations to the DOM. Um, one of the end results of this would be we can start to run more application code in a web worker. Um, web workers have existed for a really long time and are strangely underused in our community. So uh, it's a primitive that, whether it's polyfilled or implemented in browsers, once we've got some of these things in place, um, we can start to offload a lot of work off of the main thread and reduce jank on mobile. So that, that's like a huge thing that I'm hopeful for. <laughs> what do you think it is about web workers that have like stopped them from getting as much traction as they could? They're scary. <laughs> uh, also, you know, by default, when you construct a worker, you have to give it a URL. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to like, get a blob URL for an inline string, but um, it's not like the default behavior. So for, where there's like a tasklet API that might be proposed to solve that. That would be another huge feature. So that a framework shipping could instantiate a worker with some code in it, and that wouldn't be a weird thing. right? That would be expected. So. OK, so web workers. Uh, Rob, on the Angular side, did you have any opinions about that? I know that Angular has historically been trying to invest in web workers. Yeah, I, I would second the, the DOM change list API would be amazing for us. Um, <laughs> like, I think we could put it in tomorrow, and it would be, it would be ready to go. Um, so that would be a big one. And I think observables would be the other big one that we'd like to see. Um, Angular developers are using a ton of that. They seem to really enjoy it. Uh, it would be nice to not have to ship that code and not pay for those bytes. Um, and I think it opens up a lot of interesting things on APIs like Intersection Observer and Mutation Observer. I look at those and go, those are kind of perfect for the sort of thing we're talking about. So those would be the big two for me. Is there something specific other than having to ship, like, solve this problem in uh, user land mm -hmm. that shipping observables in a browser would, would bring? I could probably talk for like an hour about that. <laughs> um, I think for me that, to me, it's kind of the same thing that we went through from callbacks to promises. When we, you get a type and you get a thing you can pass around and treat like a real thing, I feel like we need the same thing for events, right? And that's more or less what an observable is for me, is that get a handle on the thing, be able to pass it around, treat it like an object. And it, it really changes how you think about doing complex event things, drag and drop, all these really highfalutin animation stuff we all want to do, this interaction stuff, I think becomes much easier when you have a primitive for, for handling really what it's delivering you. Uh, Chad, I was, I was curious, what from the, the Glimmer and Ember side do you feel is missing? Um, so again, the change list stuff. We actually have like, uh, a straw man -like implementation of this in the Glimmer VM. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing on the Glimmer side is um, instead of compiling 
uh, like a template, like how vast majority of these frameworks authors, uh, you know, projects do, what we are trying to do is compile templates directly into like a bytecode format. Um, and so the change list proposal is more kind of aligned with that because the whole idea is that you would build up all of the operations that you need to like manipulate the DOM. That's a typed array. You can transfer that across, you know, different workers and everything like that and then apply it uh, on the main thread. Um, so yeah, I think the change list or something like the change list would be, I think, great. Okay, so we've got change list. Uh, I think Tracy. we have consensus. Can we just ship that now? I think yeah. we have consensus. So you can do change list plus worker DOM. There you go. Change list and yeah. worker DOM. Alex, do you have any opinions on, on change list? No. Okay. <laughs> it's very straightforward. I'm taking bug reports here. No, like we're no just convention doing, from Alex. Here's, here's here's scribble down that you want them. So. Uh, Tracy, we, so uh, observables were mentioned. I know that in the RxJS community, observables are, are a big thing there as well. Do you have any takes on, you know, are, are, are observables something browser vendors should seriously be taking a look at baking in? Uh, yeah, I, t I totally think so. I mean, I know there is uh, the TCF 39 observable spec happening, and hopefully that moves somewhere. And uh, just earlier, uh, Rob was talking about uh, hopefully. Uh, are you guys going to champion it or? I think somebody? we may. <laughs> we're, we're looking at it. Uh, yeah. So hopefully that yeah. lands soon. Observables um, in the browser. Um, but I think uh, if if we're able to sort of start getting those types of things to happen that are sort of more native, then uh, what's going to happen is uh, I think ho hopefully the ability for people to use RxJS and the learning curve is a little bit less daunting. Yep. Awesome. Um, Malta, so I was, I was curious from the AMP side, are there other capabilities you feel are missing? So what, what I would like to say, because I already mentioned workers, um, for like what browser vendors could do is and hear us, yeah, like we all talk about workers, the developer experience in DevTools isn't great yet, so if you could invest in the future and say like maybe in a year people actually use workers, but then have the DevTools already be good, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, I also have like something, AMP doesn't really need it, but I think everyone kind of wants this, which is just really good weak maps. So they launched a feature called WeakMap. That's not actually what you usually would consider this. So just having like a cache that you can put stuff in, and maybe it's still there, but it, you know, not considered by garbage collection. Like if you build something like Relay or you know even Redux, I think everyone kind of wants this, and it's not you know been coming, and that's really sad. Okay, I saw Alex grinning at this. Cool. <laughs> uh, so Steve. Curious, did, do you feel like there are any capabilities missing from the platform that would benefit folks that are writing you know, applications using web components or Polymer? Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely second the JavaScript APIs that are mentioned. And I mean, I'm thinking a little bit more about the DOM here and just say, like, you know, there's tons of cool stuff that we run into when rendering that I think would be nice to add to the platform, um, specifically stuff like, you know, a lot of the stuff that the native elements can do that we can't do in custom element land, there's cool stuff that like the dialogue element can do that we can't do, render stuff on top of other things. In input element, of course, can do infinity stuff. It'd be awesome to deconstruct that and really add that to our toolkit, you know, so that we can use that as developers. Okay. And anything from the React side? Do you feel yeah, um, things that the browser can do that frameworks can do, APIs that expose that, I think, are always exciting to us. Um, our favorite, our current favorite API, browser API is request auto callback. Um, that is, we use that everywhere. That's kind of core to how um, we're thinking about, uh, basically what, what our goal is with React right now is, uh, did everyone enjoy that image async uh, feature um, that y'all talked about? Um, what if you could make any component async and just make any of your components um, stop blocking the main thread? Um, so scheduling primitives like request auto callback. Um, there's a really cool proposal. I think the what WG, I always get the, Different p things confused. But there's a really cool proposal, proposal called async append, um, which I think is a very interesting problem space. And this basically lets you build up this uh, tree of DOM, whether you're using React or whatever, you could mainly create this, um, and asynchronously append it into the DOM. You get a promise that says once all of the layout and everything has been done by the browser. Um, and then once the promise resolves, you can decide when you want to actually commit that change or actually flush the changes. Um, it's really cool reading that document because it's kind of just a description of what we're trying to do with React as well. But that's the type of thing that React can't do or a framework can't do is, is all of, well, unless we re-implement layout, which maybe we will. But um, <laughs> realistically, for now, we can't do that. So um, th those are the kinds of uh, APIs that we get really okay. excited about. So we saw, we saw some convergence on DOM change list. Is async append something that any other frameworks? We've seen lots of nodding and fingers, and Alex is also happy yeah. about this. Great. Great. 
Okay, we've got we've got some convergence on this. That's great. <laughs> um, let's let's move on to another question. So, uh, folks are wondering what criteria should you use if you're trying to select a JavaScript library or framework to build a new application today? And given that he's just written a blog post about performance budgets, I was curious on Alex's take on this, and then everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> Go read his post. <laughs> You might get a different answer depending on who you ask today. <laughs> I, I work on Chrome. I used to work on frameworks. Um, and working on a browser means you represent the user. And so I wind up representing the user's interest in a lot of these conversations. And the way I see people constructing applications today is incredibly well suited to the computers and networks that we were building and using about five years ago, six years ago, right? Networked computers that were, had reasonable and good, stable latency, fast pipes, copious CPU, relatively small screens compared to the amount that you had to paint. Um, so that's not the world we live in today. Mobile is much, 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 much harder uh, than any of that ever was. Uh, the latency on the networks is terrible. The pipes are smaller and variable, um, and so um, you know, we've been working with lots of partners for a lot of years, and our, I think the way I would think about this is frameworks take some amount of your headroom. How much headroom do you have is the next obvious question. And I think you have, if you're going to be building a framework-based site, you've got about 130 kilobytes on the wire, which is it. So when you're selecting a framework, I think one of your primary questions should be, how much of that 130K that you need to stuff all of your styles, all of your critical JavaScript, all of your data, um, all of your markup, templates, application logic, everything has to go in the 130 kilobytes. Um, how much of that is your framework taking is a question you should ask. So one thing I was curious, uh, Andrew, about this. You're this staring at us now. <laughs> yeah, just, just looking at you. Just looking at, just right next to me. Um, one thing I was curious about from the React side, so we, we obviously see like, a lot of applications being started today that are targeted at mobile using React, and, mm -hmm. and you know, they're, they're making a bunch of ecosystem choices about you know, using Redux, et cetera. Um, do you think that, that folks understand the costs of the ecosystem pieces they're using when it comes to trying to target mobile? And is this, this an area that need? Do I think people work? understand this problem? Um, probably depends who you talk to. Um, one like, downside, I guess, of the React ecosystem historically relative to the way um, maybe Ember or Vue, I think Vue does a good job um, with this, is that we have like, resisted the frameworks. Uh, like, I like how you put frameworks and libraries in the title. <laughs> We've resisted like, the frameworks label for a long time because um, React was designed to kind of fit into the architecture of Facebook like, from four years ago, five years ago. So in the beginning, like, we never built like, React apps as like, single page applications. Um, we were building like little, little tiny views all over a larger server rendered app. Um, so the first people that built like server rendered uh, applications were like way out ahead of us. Um, so we never like provided our own router. We never provided our own solution for data fetching. Um, so I think what, uh, to the extent that people don't care about this enough in the, maybe in the React ecosystem, I think that's, it's kind of a consequence of that. In the future, I think with things like Create React App and really cool projects like Next.js and Gatsby that are starting to give a more framework-y, holistic approach to how you're supposed to do um, service workers or server-side rendering, which is, I think is a really exciting untapped area still, um, or data fetching or whatever. Um, I think that's going to be a really exciting, important area in the next um, year or so. Cool. So yeah. one, one thing that you touched on was things like Next.js being a good mm -hmm. place to maybe. So, so you see that as being a good place for us to try defining perhaps wallet paths for people that are trying to you know, deliver applications on mobile? Uh, did you, what was the word you said? Well lit? Wallet paths. OK. Um, I don't know what that is. Um, an, <laughs> an opinionated path for folks well, that aren't. Well lit. Is that well lit. OK. Yes. Like a cow path. OK. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Where are you walking? I, I, I respond to animal metaphors. OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, th th we have resisted tra taking like, super strong opinions on things, especially because the infrastructure we use at Facebook is not. We don't really use Webpack, even though we think Webpack is really great. So we've resisted giving too many opinions. But I can see us like, shifting more in that direction. Um, there are a lot of things like uh, server-side rendering, streaming server-side rendering, uh, data fetching, of data management, uh, code delivery, like Sam was talking about earlier. There's a lot of these things that are 
really the same problem space or overlapping problem space that we don't have a great way of like pushing our solution or our vision of what that should be because we don't control like a framework e framework. Um, so uh, that's why Next and stuff really excites me uh, in the React space because they are offering a little bit more of this, and I think we will we will maybe start to dip our toe even further than create React up in the future. That's awesome, um, Jason. Uh, so. React is in a similar <laughs> spot with respect to you know, technically being a library. What, what is your take on this? Yeah, so I'd say if, if, you're, if you're making a technology decision about how you are going to structure your applications, so if you're picking something important like your view renderer, um, but what you want to know is when I'm finished this and I ship my version one, how large is it going to be? If you're picking a library, you probably need to look at what the, what the rest of the options you have are in that library space. So if you're going with React, you need to say, OK, how, how large is a common router? Do I have a, a decent selection there? Uh, you know, for the various CLI tools or server-side rendering tools like Next, um, what is the end result of those kind of ecosystem you know, approaches? Because at the end of the day, if you end up going with Next, the size of React it may not even have that much of an effect on your bundle. It's more the size of Next that you want to be concerned with. Um, and so it, like, even if you're not doing server-side rendering or Next or Gatsby or whatever, uh, look at the common CLI tool, uh, look at the boilerplate you're going to use, and see if there's like, a metric you can derive from that, not just the library. Yeah. Cool. Let's, uh, let's uh, switch up topics. Um, let's talk about interop. So uh, framework interop, web component interop has been an interesting hot topic in the community like, for a while. Um, Tracy, I was curious, what's, what's your take on this uh, with respect to, like, is, is it important for frameworks to interop together? Like, if you've got teams that are working in, you know, React and Vue and Preact, et cetera, is, is that important as a thing for, for end developers? I think you look at a lot of large companies who just do JavaScript. So a lot of companies try to say, OK, I'm just going to go the Ember route. I'm just going to go the React route. I'm just going to go this route. But then you have a lot of people who just have sort of disparate teams who try to say, OK, I have this Angular app. What's the, you know, what's this, what's the library I'm going to build with all these components? And do I stick React and Angular, or, or what do I do there? So I guess it would be nice. I mean, I think it would be nicer for some developers. Um, and I think that there are a lot of solutions, especially in the corporate world, that people have sort of stuck together. It would be nice if those were sort of more uh, forward, or maybe, maybe you guys can come up with a solutions to do that, or maybe WebTech can solve all the problems somehow. <laughs> well, since, since Tracy put you on the spot, Sean, <laughs> what, is, what is WebPacks, what, what is your take on, uh, on framework interop? You know, I think one of the biggest, so, OK, I'll speak from experience what we do at Microsoft. So we have over 98 products that ship in production that use WebPack. Um, but no single one is the same. Um, and one of the biggest initiatives that has uh, taken a significant amount of time is trying to unify some sort of component library or system. Um, I think some of the biggest debt that companies struggle with, and even one like Microsoft, is that we have to be able to move fast, add features, but then as platforms change or features are added or new frameworks uh, you know, crop up, we want to be able to take advantage of these technologies but in a way that can still be agnostic and provide interrupt between teams. Um, so like, I have my own opinions, um, and you know, I think Vue is really going to blaze the trail in terms of how we might see kind of a generic, statically analyzed kind of Rosetta Stone for lots of different frameworks to consume components. And you know, Jason and I have worked on it a couple times. Yeah. So you know, he's already has a, his, uh, a loader powered by Webpack that's already taking a Vue component and importing it into a Preact project. Yeah. And it works. So, I mean, I th there's a huge amount of you know opportunity space for lots of people to explore. So, uh, Jason, I was actually curious. You've you from uh, the Preact side of you point of uh, you've you've kind of been interested in web component support. Uh, I think that Preact's been been doing a decent job of looking at interop. You've also been um, again working with Sean on ideas around you know how can we take inspiration from things like the uh, HTML imports approach that, that you know libraries like Polymer have heavily been using and bring them to their frameworks. Could you talk a little bit about your opinions on what the future direction of that might look like? Sure. Um, so for me, a part of the part of the win here is. Uh, we essentially have a compiler model, right? The, the web is obviously a target we write code for, but it's also a target we compile code for, not just with WebAssembly and these types of things, but even just compiling to JavaScript. Um, 
But if we, if we take a look at the way that we're using these compilers and we try to model our input after existing specifications, like if, if you have a uh, compiler that takes in something that is essentially a serialized web component, right, an HTML file with JavaScript, CSS, and a template in it, um, that's an understandable independent layer. You don't need to know how whatever the framework that renders it at, you know, after compilation works. You could just sort of know how web components works. And if the framework adequately implements slots, then you know, if you know how a web component slot works, then you know how this file works. Um, I think Sean had mentioned Rosetta Stone. I think that's a good analogy for this. If we could start to converge at least a little bit on what a component looks like right across all of these different technologies, what, are, what is the substrate that they're all built on, then we can start to kind of you know, cross compile between them. You know, you, you could write a user interface components library uh, with you know beautiful CSS and encapsulation and some behaviors, and then compile it to whatever framework you're currently using, and it, it won't matter. Uh, you know, ten years from now, you could compile it to something else. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, I'm I'm curious about your take on this. So, there's there's the cross compilation idea, and then there's you know just having everything work magically at runtime. Um, what, sure. what is your take on the shape of this problem? Sure. I mean, uh, as you guys probably know, web groups are Web components are kind of designed to solve this problem. So a little bit, it makes me slightly sad that you know, it's, everybody is not just gravitating towards, towards it. <laughs> On the other hand, I think you know, the technology is evolving. It's taken a long time. And I think it's getting there. And hopefully, we will evolve it still and, and make it a satisfying answer to this issue. I think one of the places that Polymer has seen a lot of adoption, actually, is in you know, big corporations where they just have this polyglot of different stuff. And um, they just need a technology that works without you know, wherever the DOM is going to work. And this is really where something like the uh, web components shine. Um, and I think this is something where, like, as now, the, this is kind of the year of the web components specs being implemented w widely. Um, you know, I, th I hope there will be more interest among the other uh, frameworks here. Um, and I think there's, there's I want to uh, give a shout out. To, uh, Taylor did in his talk earlier, too, to the custom elements everywhere um, that Rob Dotson has done, um, which is, I think, that we took uh, a little bit for granted the fact that, hey, we're the platform. You know, everybody's just going to work with us. And I think, you know, it's like to a lot of, you know, different approaches, um, this is sort of a scary concept that now an element in the platform can be anything. It can be whatever. And I think this is partly incredibly powerful because it's sort of this democratic process of the cream of the crop can, can rise. And, um, and, you know, but at the same time, it's also like, but that thing could do anything. It's kind of scary. Do I really want to use that? And this is where I think the approach between custom elements everywhere is really interesting, because it kind of is this idea that, you know, this, the framework authors and the community of developers making these custom elements really have to meet in the middle, you know, and establish best practices such that, you know, it makes sense to these, use these things all together and we can all benefit. So hopefully that happens. Rob, so. Uh... Angular has been investing in trying to improve their interop with custom elements mm. and web components in general um, for the last while. What's, what's your take on this? So uh, I kind of feel like the Rosetta Stone that, that Sean was talking about, I think that's what a custom element is. I think that, that that is. And I don't think this group of people would agree on many things, right? <laughs> Completely against the group. But I do think that we've all more or less landed on this idea that there are events and there are props or property, whatever you want to call them, right? We all have kind of an API that if you squint, it's more or less the same. So to maybe make your year a little bit better, today a little bit better, like I can, I can say that our team has decided that you know, we've, we've always consumed web components. That was a day one design decision in Angular. Um, I talk to enough big companies, I'm sure you know, companies that, that Palmer in, that have these very disparate ecosystems, have a dozen different frameworks. I think it's very sad as a web developer that everybody has to rewrite the date picker in every framework that exists, right? If Absolutely. I do one thing as a web, like somebody who works on, on the web now, we can just write one date picker that's awesome and then use it everywhere, <laughs> I'll just quit, right? <laughs> so, so from our perspective, right, Angular is a, is a framework-y framework, as you said, right? We, we do try to solve a lot of these problems. And so for us, it's, you know, I think our bread and butter is these big applications that everybody likes to build. But for me, it would be great if Angular components could be spit out as web components, right? It's, it's a thing that you look at it, and it's a no-brainer. And so. Six weeks ago, we started really looking into this. I've been complaining about it for 18 months. I said to Alex Russell when I joined Google that we're going to make this happen, and finally it's happening. Um, so you'll be able to write an Angular component and spit it out as a custom element. Um, and I think that the most important thing about that, the, the kind of crux to all of this custom element stuff, is that nobody has to know anything about how the component was implemented to make it work, because everybody in this room already knows how the DOM works, right? And if that becomes the common API we all talk to, 
it doesn't really matter what happens inside of the component, right? We can all have this Rosetta Stone, we can all talk, and we can write one date picker, and everybody can be happy, right? So on, on that note, um, it sounds like there's, there's some, some interesting convergence on the Rosetta Stone idea. Uh, I'm curious, from the React perspective, what's, what's React's take on web components? Yes, we have a slightly different take. Um, <laughs> <laughs> web components are really cool. I think they definitely solve, um, they solve the encapsulation problem, uh, and they solve the consumption problem where you should be able to consume a component. You shouldn't have to learn 15 different ways to consume a component. And surely you can wrap any React app in a web component. It's not, not that hard. The question is whether or not we should replace like, React components as a primitive for building your application with just writing a bunch of web components. And on that note, we're not as convinced. Um, because we use, I, I, I could be wrong, but I, th I think another uh, selling point for uh, web components is that perhaps it obviates the need for a virtual DOM, or for us to have to manage our own like, uh, like parallel uh, in-memory representations of your view. And on that, uh, on that part, uh, web components don't solve that for us. So, because we use um, our internal instances not just for encapsulation, but we use it for memoization, we use it for um, you know, computing changes, we use it for scheduling, that's the big one. Um, uh, I don't know if you all have heard of this uh, recent effort we had to rewrite React, but we're moving in a direction with React 16 and going forward where we're going to have async by default rendering. Uh, and what, what this means is we need to be able to do, um, well, we're going to do all of our rendering work inside of request idle callback, basically. Um, and in order to do that, you need like this double pass kind of rendering system where you have two phases. One, you have an re uh, async render phase where you do most of your expensive work. It's all in request idle callback, or maybe in the future it's on a web worker or whatever. Uh, and then you have a synchronization phase where once you can compute all of your mutations into a DOM change list, maybe, um, you can syn uh, synchronously flush all of them all at once. Um, and that's the type of architecture which we're really excited about. There's a lot of cool um, features that you can build on top of this, but it's not really possible without implementing um, your own data structures. So um, we're like thumbs up on web components, but we don't think it replaces the need to um, have our own data structures. Alex, do you have any takes on this? Yeah, I mean, so um, full disclosure, uh, Dimitri Klaskov, Alex Komorowski, and I started the project at Google that sort of started the web components effort. Um, we're sorry, <laughs> apologize, you know, catch me later, buy you a beer. Um, I don't think web components actually have any bearing on whether or not you should have a virtual DOM, right? It's, it's virtual DOM becomes an implementation detail about how your component decides to handle um, getters, setters, attribute setting, and all the stuff. Web components, as, a, as an implementation, um, give you a surface area that everybody knows as Rob said, so you can just reuse the date picker from wherever. And then how you want to handle that question about how state gets handled inside of your component is now up to you. It doesn't do any global coordination. So I think this is one of these places where web components disaggregate a bunch of things that frameworks used to do. Frameworks have traditionally taken a bunch of different responsibilities between ensuring compatibility across the DOM, giving you a component model in the first place, making sure that those component updates are coordinated in various places, doing data um, distribution uh, and event handling. And web components sort of disentangle a couple of those and leave you with a few of those problems. They don't solve everything. So a few of those still have to happen. Um, and it's interesting to see how the various frameworks are sort of uh, reorienting themselves now that web components are kind of a thing. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think I've seen lots of people, um, you know, Skate.js is doing this great work where they're using virtual DOM inside of custom elements, uh, which is super cool. They're maybe using Preact internally, uh, which is, you know, not removing a virtual DOM, but it does leave that global coordination question open. Cool, and, uh, sorry. So I was just gonna say just a sentence on the, on the interop thing, just to go back a little bit. Um, I just want to, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but one, the thing that we've found that's interesting about interop is, um, is this coordination problem. Uh, at Facebook, we use React everywhere, but the other framework that we use is server-side rendering. Uh, and if you think about it, both of, uh, we have this, this system called um, uh, Big Pipe. If you think about it, both of these are asynchronous systems, and it becomes a really interesting problem how to coordinate two asynchronous uh, renderers so that things aren't popping in on the screen at different times. Okay, and circling back to Malta, uh, 
AMP is one of the largest consumers of custom elements. Uh, I'm kind of curious on your take about interop. So I, I just had this conversation with the product manager saying, hey, we need a date picker in AMP. And I'm like, oh my god, not again. Mm. Uh, and so, <laughs> what we ended up doing was taking the Airbnb React date picker, using it with Preact, so it's not actually like 60 kilobytes, and putting it in the custom element. <laughs> and, because, and, and it works right. fine, like AMP is Airbnb date picker. Um, and, and that is like, I'm worried, worried about the people who like, put all these massive frameworks in these little encapsulated things. Um, I think we need to understand that just because something is great on the interop level and we don't have to make a new date picker um, doesn't mean we don't need an application framework. Now, on the other hand, like AMP right now doesn't actually allow you to write code in any other framework. Um, so interop is a bit awkward. But I think what our goal is, um, is in the long term that you could just use you know, React to render the stuff that you want to change in AMP document at runtime. Like, I think the current state is not where we want this to be. Um, that's just you know, the thing we could implement in fall 2015. Nice. Uh, switching gears up a bit, we, we are running a little bit over, um, but I'm just going to take one or two final questions. Uh, what impact is WebAssembly going to have, if any, on JavaScript frameworks and libraries? Uh, Chad, do you have any takes on this? Um, so I think WebAssembly is kind of interesting. Uh, there's certain things I, I, I really like to talk today, basically. Um, it's not a replacement for JavaScript, but there's in places where you need the performance, uh, I think it will play a larger part of, you know, not, maybe not you know, everyday developers writing it, but framework authors may you opt into writing a little bit of C code to maybe eke out a little bit of more performance. Uh, this is like some things that we're experimenting with, uh, with Glimmer's in very high critical performance scenarios, we want to try to eke out as much as possible, uh, eke out enough performance as possible. Awesome. Uh, Jason, did you have any other takes on WebAssembly? Uh, just something that came up. I'm like a total WebAssembly noob, but uh, something that came <laughs> up over lunch. Uh, <laughs> you laugh. That's true. Yeah. Um, I know the API. That's about it. Um, also, I wouldn't trust myself to write native code. No. <laughs> so, but one, one interesting area that got touched on was um, for something like a polyfill for a really performance critical feature, having the ability to write at least parts of the polyfill in WebAssembly could be really compelling. Um, we were talking about DOM change list. If there's uh, you know, diff computations or something that needs to happen in there or the creation of that, um, that array buffer, if that's better done in C and WebAssembly is available, why wouldn't you do it? So, seems like it'd be powerful there. Yeah. So our, our final question is, uh, is not strictly going to do with APIs, but uh, we had a question around, you know, what can we as a group do to improve diversity in open source, which I think is a really important topic and something that I'd, I'd personally love to see us make some traction on. Um, Tracy, I was, I was interested in your take on this. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of really great programs out, like um, as a, I'm a Google Developer Group uh, organizer, and there's a Women Tech Makers initiative that happens. Um, and it's a really great way to sort of, you know, bring women developers together and give them a safe space to learn. I think uh, if you talk to women across, women and just everybody in general, but I, I focus on women because I'm a female. So. <laughs> Uh, if you talk to women in general, you know, everybody has varying ideas of acceptance and inclusion and what it should be and what it shouldn't be. So I think, um, you know, not really forcing your opinions on women, but just uh, giving them a way for, you know, them to contribute the way they want to. I think it's just also encouragement in general. Um, I think in our industry, you know, we have this diversity problem and uh, a lot of companies are looking for these senior developers where when you actually look at our industry, you see a lot of junior female developers coming in. And what we need to do is sort of somehow figure out a way that we're able to encourage these junior developers so that we can build senior developers. And I think that's the biggest problem right now. That's the biggest disconnect we have. I agree with that. Uh, Sean, you also, this is a problem that you, you have some thoughts on. Yeah, I mean, um... Like if it wasn't for open source, I wouldn't be here. I'd still be like in tech support, or you know, like just you know doing whatever. And so it's like, and thanks to you know a little bit of my privilege, what, why does this have to be a unique story for, for just you know myself? Like, 
we should be able to not only elevate the opportunities for every single person to be able to receive the same blessings that many of us have just by being involved and passionate about something. And so uh, one of the things that, we're, you know, that we've seen is that we have specific outreaches for Webpack, not only that span gender or race, but even just countries. Um, like we have an initiative called Webpack Africa that we're starting and um, a gentleman named Prosper, if you haven't met him, where's, raise your hand maybe, he's, a, he's back there somewhere. Um, he's helping lead that organization and their goal was we need to prepare people for the web for the next billion people. And so it's like, that means that we could have the opportunity to elevate somebody to a whole new life opportunity for the next million con contributions or developers. And so like, we want to find as many ways as possible to essentially elevate or provide more opportunities so that these success stories don't have to be unique, they don't have to be rare. On that note, we're out of time. Uh, please join me in giving a hand to all of our panelists who are very kind enough to take time out to come here today.